let's take a look at fossil fuels and nuclear power plants. And we'll start out with fossil fuels. So we saw last time that fossil fuels are the most common primary energy source used in the world today. And whether you use gas, coal, or oil, the way to convert the fossil fuel into electrical energy is essentially the same. You use a thermal power plant. You burn the energy source, the fossil fuel, and then thermal energy from that burning, that combustion, is transferred to water, which then boils, and then that steam then goes on and turns a turbine, converting the thermal energy to kinetic energy. The turbine's kinetic energy is used to spin a generator, which converts the energy to electrical energy, which is sent to your home and can be used. So that is a very common and relatively straightforward way of using a primary energy source to create electrical energy, a secondary energy source, which is necessary for the modern world. But fossil fuels do have their problems. Um, they are not renewable, and the remaining amount is not well estimated. It's not well known. Also, many of the fossil fuels are in locations which are difficult and or expensive to reach. Also, burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide and other pollutants. Now, we'll talk more about carbon dioxide later. Another problem is that fossil fuels have to be transported to the power plants. So the location where the fossil fuels are, and the location of the power plants that use them, is pretty different. So, for instance, we have these huge pipelines that take natural gas and oil from the location where they are extracted to the location where they're used. We have oil tankers that travel the world and carry the oil from the place where it's extracted to the place where it's used. Same with coal. We have huge rail networks to transport the coal from where it's extracted to where it's used. Now next we're going to look at nuclear power plants. And there are many different nuclear power plant designs, but the most common is based on uranium fission in a pressurized water reactor, or PWR. And I'll try to draw a diagram of one right here. At the heart of it, there is the nuclear fuel. And we'll talk more about the details of nuclear fuel later, but the big idea is that the nuclear fuel undergoes fission, and that fission process releases huge amounts of energy. That energy is transferred to the water surrounding the nuclear fuel, and the water is kept at a high pressure. It's pressurized water, and that's all contained within the reactor. So the pressurized water is pressurized so that it will not change phase. It remains a liquid even though it reaches very high temperatures. So this nuclear fuel releases energy, that thermal energy is transferred to the water, and the water reaches a very high temperature but does not change phase because it's pressurized. The high temperature, high pressure water then leaves the reactor and through a series of pipes transfers some of its thermal energy to another set of water. And it's important to realize, the pressurized water never mixes with this second pool of water. The pressurized water is always contained in a closed system. It does not mix with any other set of water. Now, this second body of water is heated by the pressurized water. And the second body of water is not pressurized. It is allowed to change phase, so the pressurized water transfers thermal energy to the second body of water. The second body of water heats up, produces steam. The steam then goes through a pipe, turns a turbine. The turbine is connected to a generator which produces electrical energy which then leaves the power plant. And then the steam, which has lost some of its thermal energy as it passed through the turbine, then comes back around. It's cooled down by a third body of water, a cool water pool, and after it's cooled down and condensed back into water, it goes back to the original tank, where it can be heated again by the pressurized water that came from the nuclear reactor. Now, this cool water pool over here is what we often associate with nuclear power plants, because there, that cool water pool, the idea is that the water that came from the turbine is transferring some of its thermal energy to this cool water, and this cool water often turns into steam and it exits the power plant, and it exits the power plant through the cooling water towers, which are those distinctly shaped things that we often associate with nuclear power plants. 
Now, one of the reasons why a pressurized water reactor design is so popular is because if you look at it, it's really pretty similar to thermal power plants for fossil fuels. It's just instead of combustion, which is producing thermal energy that's transferred to the water, instead, we have this pressurized water, which transports thermal energy from the nuclear fuel to the water, which then becomes steam and turns the turbine. Now, let's look a little bit more at the nuclear fuel. Inside the nuclear reactor, that nuclear fuel is usually uranium-235. Uranium-235 can undergo fission. However, most uranium in the world is uranium-238, a different isotope of uranium. And uranium-238 cannot easily fission. So the ore, the material that you actually dig up from the ground, must have the uranium-238 removed before it can be used as fuel. This process of, re of removing the uranium-238 and increasing the concentration of uranium-235 is called enrichment. Enrichment of uranium is a long process and it requires pretty advanced chemistry. But the essential idea is that the ore that's dug up has to be turned into a fine powder and then that powder of uranium is put into a centrifuge which spins very, very fast. Now, when that happens, the heavier uranium, the uranium-238, moves to the outside. And then that uranium-238 that's on the outside of the centrifuge is then removed. The remaining powder in the centrifuge then is enriched with uranium-235. There's more uranium-235 left in the remaining powder. Now, to do this, to really enrich the uranium-235 requires many, many spins in multiple centrifuges. It's a vast undertaking, and it requires pretty significant technology. Once it's enriched, the uranium fuel contains about 3% uranium-235, and the rest is mostly uranium-238. Now, to achieve fission, the uranium-235 has to be hit with a slow, also called a thermal, neutron. A fast neutron impacting your uranium-235 nucleus will not cause the uranium-235 to fission. If that happens, if you send in a fast neutron, the uranium-235 will just spit it back out. So a thermal neutron, or a slow neutron, is required to cause fission in a uranium-235 nucleus. When that happens, the fission reaction produces three more neutrons. However, those three neutrons that come out of the reaction are fast neutrons. So for the produced neutrons that come out of the fission reaction to create more fissions, to cause more fissions in other uranium-235 nuclei, they have to be slowed down. They have to be slowed down into thermal neutrons. This is accomplished by using something called a moderator. A moderator is a substance which slows down fast neutrons that come out of the uranium-235 fission so that they become thermal neutrons, which can then cause more fissions. Water and graphite, which is a type of carbon, are common moderators. Now, to control the rate of fission in the fuel, there has to be a way to remove the neutrons. If you don't remove any of the neutrons, then you can get a runaway reaction. You'll get too many fissions, you'll get more and more fissions, and your reaction will go out of control and you'll get an explosion. So the way that you control the fission reaction is you have to remove some of the neutrons. This is done using control rods. Control rods are made of a material which absorbs neutrons, preventing them from causing more fission reactions. Control rods are often made of boron or cadmium. So I'll draw a little diagram of a nuclear reactor right here. Here's the nuclear fuel where the fission happens. And here's the control rods. And the control rods are usually designed so that they can be raised and lowered. And if they're raised, if they're taken out of the reactor, then that will increase the reaction rate because now you're not going to absorb as many neutrons. There will be more neutrons flying around to cause more fission reactions. If you lower the control rods into the reactor, if the control rods are more in the reactor, then the control rods are more able to absorb neutrons and the reaction rate will decrease. This is all contained in a strong containment vessel. And the strong containment vessel has multiple purposes. One purpose is to prevent heat from escaping. 
And another big purpose is to prevent radiation from escaping, because these fission reactions are producing lots and lots of gamma rays and other types of radiation. Now, it's not perfect, but if it's concrete and it's very thick, also maybe lead, um, it can prevent much of the radiation from escaping the container. Also, we have the water as the moderator in there. Remember, the water as moderator is there to slow the neutrons that are produced in the fissions, which so that we can create more fissions. It's trying to take those fast neutrons and turn them into thermal neutrons. Now, it's important to realize the water that's in the reactor does not mix with the water that drives the turbine or the water in the coolant pool. The reactor water instead heats other water. It's just heating the water that then goes to the turbine. The water from the reactor and the water in the turbine exchange heat through pipes, but they don't mix. And they don't mix because of radiation contamination in the reactor water. The reactor water does contain radioactive materials from the control rods, so you don't want it mixing with the rest of your water. You want it contained in a closed system. One problem with nuclear reactors, of course, is that the products of the fission reactions are radioactive. So this waste, these products of the fission reaction, this nuclear waste, has to be contained and it has to be disposed of in some safe way. Usually, it's buried in a remote location. That's a major problem politically. No one really wants nuclear waste near where they live. And in the United States, there has been no agreement about where to put the nuclear waste. And at the moment, most nuclear power plants keep the waste on site and they're just waiting to be told what to do with it as a permanent solution. Now, one of the worst things that can happen to a nuclear power plant is something called a meltdown. In a meltdown, the fuel rods themselves get so hot that they melt. The two most common ways that this can occur is, number one, the water, the pressurized water, can leak from the reactor. And if you don't have the pressurized water in the reactor, then the fuel rods have no way of getting rid of their internal energy. They have no way of transferring thermal energy to anything else because the water isn't there. And so if they can't transfer their energy to the pressurized water, the energy just builds up inside of them and their temperature increases and increases and increases until they melt. Another way that it can happen is if the control rods cannot be lowered into the reactor. If you cannot lower the control rods, then the rate of fission reactions will increase and increase and increase, and the fuel rods will continue to produce more and more energy until they get hot enough that they melt. Now, the reason why a meltdown is a problem is because if the reactor fuel melts, then you can't cool it off before it damages the reactor itself. The fuel melts down to the floor of the reactor, and it can melt through the floor and contaminate the area around the reactor. This is a very bad thing uh, to happen, um, and most reactors are designed so that it's very unlikely, but this is sort of the nightmare scenario with most pressurized water reactors.